In today's episode of the Bravery Academy, we're going to be looking at the way that you deal with stress in the workplace. Nobody is immune to this. We're all going to, at times of our lives, get triggered, and it can then flow over into all aspects of our health. I'm going to be joined by Dr. Victoria Thompson today. She is our resident psychologist on the Bravery Academy podcast. Today's episode is looking at how you show up at work to deal with those stress triggers and what you can be in control of to help you bring yourself back to calm. Today, we're going to be looking at what we do for a third of our life. That is one of the biggest stress triggers that we will experience. And it is work. Yep. The way that we deal with work. And what we're only just seeing now is a revolution in businesses that are on the cusp, the forefront, looking at what well-being looks like to help our businesses and our teams thrive at work. What we're seeing from the research is that it comes down to the way that we're dealing with stress. And in today's episode, looking at work, we're looking at it from an individual. What are our expectations? What is our warning signs around this? How do we shift that stress volume down so that the way that we show up at work is going to be in a way that's going to create connection and joy and productivity? Now, it's not always easy. As you'll hear from even Vic at the start of this episode, we all get triggered. This is the piece of common humanity. So what we want particularly out of today is this little slice of awareness, this little moment of knowing that you can take control if you choose and if you listen in. Learning to listen in is the first step in shifting that body's reaction and the impact that chronic stress can have on your body. And today we're going to look at those small little moments of awareness that can become a snowball into shifting your reactivity long term. And that catalyst of changing the way that you deal with stress can create safety in the body, more connection, and more joy in the way that you show up for work. Welcome along, Dr. Vic. I'm so thrilled to have you in here to talk about all things work and all things stress. How are you today? I'm feeling okay. Not too bad. Not too bad? (laughs) Perhaps a little anxious about recording today, but that's all right. It's new, right? Something different to jump into? Yeah, it is new. It's new and, you know, lots of unknowns about how it'll go and and all of those things. So trying to make space for that. And we've had so much change in the last few years, right? This pandemic has probably been the starting point for our conversation today. So tell me about the impact that the pandemic's had on the people that you work with. Yeah, it's had a massive impact, it really has. It's supported by the research as well. What we're seeing is like quite a significant increase in mental distress for people post-pandemic. So not only experiencing anxiety and depression during the pandemic, but it seems to be continuing on and it doesn't seem to have any signs of slowing down. Mm. Um, Some evidence that it's sort of an increase of anxiety and depression by about 25% which is massive. Mm. And what we also need to take into account is that there's also been a significant impact on mental health services. So the way that they're run and the amount of resources and, you know, people working in those services as well, being impacted by their own difficulties with the pandemic means that there's been a lot of disruption to psychological service in particular. So our ability to deliver service, but also a people's ability to access services. So it's had a substantial impact on not only people's mental health, but also the resources that we have available to us to be able to support people. So I'm hearing the volume's gone up and the number of people dealing with it and also the intensity of it but actually we haven't been able to expand this kind of bottleneck is what I've also been noticing for people that they've been going I don't know where to turn to I don't know how to to move forward with this I don't know what those resources look like for dealing Mm -hmm. with this because we haven't been equipped it's the first pandemic I've been through what I'm seeing in businesses is that there has been a long hangover of the Mm -hmm. pandemic the impact of it isn't just this kind of like right back to business you know just get on with it it's like There is so much that has been created because of this experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. And if we think about anxiety in particular, for some people, there's a real genetic predisposition to experiencing anxiety. 
And often, you know, if you think about the nature nurture hypothesis, there's often a trigger event in there that can cause people to experience more disordered anxiety. So for a lot of people, this pandemic and the experience of it, perhaps it was the the loss of a close loved one, or perhaps it was the isolation from others, financial stress that may have been sort of the smoking gun that's led them to experience anxiety in a more significant form for them. And I think that's a, a such a good place to, to kind of again go back to is that feeling of anxiety and understanding that and what that means. I know there was moments throughout that time when, you know, our uh, we're based in New Zealand, right? So when our prime minister went, we're closing the borders. Mm -hmm. And I just went, oh, I don't know what this means. I don't know how Mm -hmm. to navigate this. This loss of control, of course, is going to hijack all of us. And we didn't know when was it going to finish. It was all out of our control. How does that impact us? What is happening in our mind and the way that we react with that stress? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the thing that anxiety seems to thrive on is uncertainty. So what anxiety tries to make us do desperately is to try and find control and certainty. And that can look like lots of ruminating thoughts, thinking over and over against about the same situation. So perhaps during the pandemic, you know, you might have got ruminating thoughts about how long is this going to last for? What does this mean for my future? Well, if she said this on Tuesday, well, then on Wednesday, she said this, and how do I make sense of this? So despite the the reality being that it was out of our control, somehow our brain and the anxiety driving it likes to try and get us to fill in the gaps. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I like that. So it's that mind taking over and almost having a different narrative or taking us on an even more extensive narrative around what is happening and that loss of control. I think that's the role that the psychology element has to this is when you begin to get those tools to understand, you know, what that rumination is about and how do you circuit break it? How do you Mm. change that reaction? And I know from the body's point of view, when you have that thought process, yes, you're going to be breathing in a different way. Your body's going to be hijacked. It's going to feel like it's uncomfortable and you have all the symptoms of that being hijacked by stress. And that can happen, obviously, at that bigger level of the pandemic taking over. But it can also happen in a day-to-day process in work, right? You know, the minute you get out of bed and you go, what's going to happen today? That feeling of uncomfortable that something is going to be out of my control. I just want to come back to this piece of this work-induced anxiety, that that's really quite common. And I know how you put it, the Sunday scares. (laughs) And I remember having that throughout my life in different ways. And I've had lots of different careers, but my background as a physiotherapist meant that I had lots of different environments before I had my own physio practice. I remember 10 years ago when I was selling my physio practice, this most uncomfortable feeling of going into work because I felt like I had was letting my team down by selling the business. It was very much this, this feeling of going, oh, it, it doesn't feel right, but I know that it feels right for me. While I wasn't hijacked by anxiety, my body was still saying, this doesn't feel good. So how do you get people to deal with those tough moments when they feel like that? Yeah, I mean, the Sunday scare is like quite a common phenomenon. I think it's something like 80% of people experience that, which is probably a bigger conversation about, you know, what on earth are we doing in terms of <laughs> how much work stress and responsibilities we've all got mm. going on? Because that's to me, is a really frightening figure. It's huge. So huge, right? 80%. Sunday nights is not good. And, you know, there's a nice, I suppose, a a moment there of self-compassion around the shared experience of difficulty among, you you know, people around you that you may not even be aware of. The fact that sort of these 80% of people may be feeling the same way that you're feeling on a Sunday. So moments of shared and common humanity in that as well. Look, work stress is inevitable and we will all experience stress at work and that's okay and that's normal because we can tolerate periods of stress. Mm. The difficulty, of course, comes when the stress keeps enduring and you're feeling it every day when you're going to work and can show up for people quite prominently on a Sunday, perhaps because you've got the whole week ahead filled with meetings or presentations or interactions with a challenging colleague or a difficult manager. 
And so people experience an increase in anxiety on a Sunday night, which can make them feel quite distracted from being engaged at home, can impact sleep, lots of sort of catastrophic thoughts can arise. So I think there are some things that one could do to navigate Sunday scaries. My advice is that sometimes it's good to sit in the anxiety for a bit and other times it's good to try and implement other things to distract the mind a little bit. So trying to do a few things on a Sunday, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, but trying to at least keep active or occupied for some of Sunday some other things that you should be mindful of is just trying to make sure that you're keeping up your adequate nutrition, that you've got a good bedtime routine set up for your Sunday night. And, you know, there are some other things that you can do around sort of challenging the thoughts and the catastrophic thinking that might show up for you on a Sunday. I like the fact that you've said it's actually okay to sit in that anxiety. Often we don't want to feel it, right? We don't want to actually experience it. And so we're trying to avoid it, but it's still there. And so you've Mm. actually got to figure out how do you listen and how do you process it, whether it's writing it down and being able to go, oh, these are the things that are making me feel anxious or a fear reaction coming on and then again that's when you're saying you can have that that common humanity self-compassion moment you go well actually I'm probably not the only person feeling this right now Mm -hmm. and actually I probably can't change it right now too right because when we're thinking about it that that's still going to make our body react as if a lion's chasing us and that survival reaction is coming on but actually we can't change it in that moment so also that acknowledgement of well I'm feeling like that but I actually can't shift it until maybe tomorrow or until I've tackled that thing on my to-do list. Mm. And so I feel like perspective and like we said, that mindset shift around challenge and stress is really important there. Conflict is scary. So Mm. how do I move into Monday knowing that maybe something's not sitting comfortable? Who are my people to go to and talk to about that? Absolutely. I, I think it's such a hard line to find sometimes between knowing what is a tolerable level of stress for you versus when is it becoming over overbearing and impacting your life so much and it's always a hard a hard thing to try and work out particularly that's, if you're you know trying to do it yourself yeah and then that's it because there's a stress continuum so when I what I wanted to have with mm. this podcast people understanding like you said stress is normal stress is beautiful it's powerful it's actually your superpower when you learn to listen into it mm. because it's the mind and the body speaking saying hey I'm happy I'm not happy can you figure out how to kind of nurture me and support me Unfortunately, we drive the body so hard that we don't actually always do that. And so when we have stress sensations, which can be those warning signs being fatigue or fear or rumination, like you're saying, from the mind down or from that body up, then these are not necessarily bad things. They are actually us being able to go, how much volume can I cope with of the stress in my nervous system? And that all depend on where we've come from, you know, that bandwidth of tolerance that we've been under. If we've already had a rough few years, childhood impact and other experiences mm-hmm. that have then, I guess, decreased that bandwidth in that window, then sometimes that inevitable kind of spiral of stress can kind of creep in, right? And that's when that chronic work stress can become very challenging. So when is enough mm-hmm. enough and how do we listen into that? How do we turn that volume down? Mm-hmm. So I think what we're kind of getting to there as well is this place of chronic stress when it kind of slowly builds up to tipping over. What have you noticed with the clients that you work with and when they finally go, I need help? Usually people do come to my office when they have reached that point already. So yeah, unfortunately it's not often that people seem to see it coming. They tend to come when they're really at breaking point, Mm. which I mean, is you know, one of the reasons why it's great to talk about this sort of thing, because ideally we kind of be catching these things before we get ourselves into a place where we feel so dreadful and burnt out that we feel like we can't cope at work. What I notice is that it's usually a couple of things are going on, right? There's an interaction between your internal sense of self, how you're perceiving yourself at work, what your values are, what your boundaries are, and an interaction with external factors. And a lot of the time, the things that people struggle with are poor management Mm -hmm. or other colleagues. And another one, I suppose, feeling like they're not being valued. So I would say that those are kind of the the three things that I see the most. It's not often that it's the work itself 
it's rather kind of interactions with those, yeah, those ex- internal beliefs about self, but also other people in the working environment. I work a lot with businesses and when we have these conversations around what are our triggers and drivers, with the room of 20 men and women in there, everybody has a, a different variety, right? So it's not going to be one driver and it will change depending on what situation you're in at the time. And I think the expectations on self is is one of the biggest ones, particularly I feel for women. But I don't know if you can speak to that, if we have a high perfectionistic trait that will keep us driven to people, please. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of research indicating that that, that could be some gender difference in there because of, you know, how we're expected to show up by society, that we are the caregivers, the compassionate ones, the nurturers. And, and, and as such, when we people please, we get rewarded for that. People encourage, you're so kind, you're so nice, you're so helpful. And that yeah, that does tend to be the case for a lot of women. And in turn, yes, I mean, for me in particular, I do see a lot of women with perfectionistic traits and that can cause quite a lot of dysfunction for people in many facets of their life but I suppose talking about work the idea of perfectionism being you know this internal drive that that you must reach unrelenting standards so people who struggle with perfectionism feel driven to keep achieving with the the sort of harsh reality being that it's never ever good enough, no matter what you do, and you're kind of more intolerant of failure than mm. others. Mm. Yeah. So even that psychological driver of the expectations kind of shortens your bandwidth because you of stress. Is that what I'm hearing too? Yeah, you're constantly on. You're more vigilant to perceived failures. Mm. You're less tolerant of feedback. Mm. You not only have in those cases, the external pressure from your manager or your colleagues, you know, to to try and meet the work demands. But you've also got this really loud voice inside you that beats you up when you don't feel like you're meeting the demand or that you are sort of not meeting the standards that you've set for yourself. And that voice is normal, right? I guess that's something that I've had to explain to clients is that those voices that we have are actually normal that they're there what they're saying to you isn't always normal and right and we can actually rewire them but it's those belief systems and expectations that are like you said in many ways the driver and I think that is what one of the things I want people to highlight is the more that you can figure out how to listen into that and change that conversation and bring in some of that self-compassion as we said there's some great research by a lady called Kristen Neff on self-compassion and it it doesn't it's less woo-woo now when we understand Mm -hmm. that you actually can have these tools to change it in the moment as well and that can be enough to help decrease that stress volume and change that expectations but it's actually still hard work right I don't I'm not going to give pretend and sugarcoat this and say (laughs) suddenly you're going to listen to this podcast episode and go right I've got to let the expectations go I'm I'm working just a little bit too hard here I'm just going to say no to everybody and they're going to be okay with that like it's hard work (laughs) to change these right yeah it's incredibly hard I mean these belief systems we developed when we were really young you know for perfectionism one of the things we talked about is that when you're young and you kind of think that your parents are the be all and end all so if they praise you for helping out around the house Mm -hmm. or getting good grades well then you're going to go oh well bloody hell I need to keep doing that yeah and so I keep meeting these standards another common one can be when you've got a set of perfectionistic parents yourself and that's modeled to you Mm -hmm. so it's important to remember, like you said, that these these beliefs and the way that we in, interact with the world, these have all been shaped from an incredibly young age. And then you, you hit whatever age you're at now <laughs> listening to this and you think, oh, okay, right, that, I, it does sound a bit like me. I've got to try and change these. But, of course, they're embedded and they do take time to change. The positive of that is that they can change, that our brain has plasticity and we can rewire connections, but it takes hard work. Mm -hmm. And that can be really scary for people and incredibly intimidating Yes, um, because it it, it does require a lot of vulnerability and self-reflection, and that's hard to do. 
that is exactly the words that came coming up for me because I work with women and men, but in these group environments too, where it feels so scary to actually mm. show up and say, I don't like the way that I'm speaking to myself, or I don't like the way that I have been behaving or that my body's been reacting. And when people start to go, oh, but I'm the same, like they raise their hands almost and go, oh, me too. I have been feeling this way and it is so common, but if we can change that expectation to being one that actually my expectation is that this is going to be something that I can work on, that is a circuit breaker right there. Yeah. Even the languaging of that, you know, is important. What we can tend to do is go, I got to stop this. I've got to change it. I must. I, this is so stupid. Mm-hmm. And all of these really, judgmental internal thoughts about how we are and how we interact with the world that we become frustrated at ourselves which you know the frustration is understandable but it's not helpful to direct it so heavily inwards because then you get the distress from the impacts that your belief systems are having on you but also then the judgment layer above that which amplifies your emotions so um when we're thinking about wanting to do things differently, it, it should come from a place of compassion and kindness to the self rather than feeling like there's something so wrong with you that you must do this and, and it's shoulds and musts, mm. that sort of thing. So that's mm. very much around that internal driver. But then you've also mm. got this external aspects of now that we're probably living in a new world of maybe work from home. And then there's some businesses that can't do that, right? You know, hospitality or healthcare, we're still face-to-face mm. people, but there's pressures in a different way. What are the ways that we can be kinder to ourselves then? Because it is new and it is challenging. It's really interesting as well when you look into the, the research around the impacts of work from home on mental well-being because people have such different responses to it. Some people seem to really thrive like that and mm. others find it really hard and they can't motivate themselves. The literature kind of reflects that is that some people find it beneficial but others really struggle with the sort of loneliness and the isolation and that aspect of it. I think it's it's just particularly challenging in terms of balancing your home life alongside work. I think we've all been there where we are trying to get some work done, but then you're like, oh, I should do that load of washing or I do just need to do that. Let me just. And so it is harder for us to set boundaries. And the literature is showing that that's particularly challenging for mothers Mm -hmm. um, in the caregiving role when they've got children to look after and and perhaps that their boundaries become a little more blurred in terms of how much time that they can give to look after their child's needs versus showing up for work. Mm. Seems like an impossible battle really, a bit of a juggle. Yeah, I feel that. I mean, I've got two kids, they're nine and 12, so they're at this stage and they are at a great age, but there's also still that pull, you know, to be present and then figuring out all the things on my to-do list to be a mother and to be a parent and to do that. And then there's the other list that is the showing up for business. And it became the normal, you know, to have your kids in the background for the Zooms and the consults. And we don't always have that support person to rely on, whether it's your partner, whether it's family around there. We're not designed to live in isolation. We're actually meant to be in tribes. Everybody in society is going to be challenged. And for women, Mm. for women that are mothers, for women that are mothers in businesses, there is just more dynamics for that. And it's not saying that we can't do those things, but it may be that we then need to ask for different help in a different way. And that Mm. I think is around how we manage stress in some areas of that. I've had an amazing support network for the last two years, which has made it a little bit easy to navigate with family around to help support with my children we've got so isolated with that and I think that's also why a lot of the anxiety came on for people when they were were trying to trying to juggle working from home raising kids teaching them assuming that they're going to be able to learn from home and feeling the guilt and the shame around not being enough for them and what the impact of that is as well and I'm not sure if men felt the same way I, I don't know if they did because the way that we're wired I mean, that women have this aspect of tend and befriend. The stress reaction to them is different from guys. I think that a lot of the men that I've worked with during the pandemic, the pressures were often around, you know, another lovely gender role that we have, but the financial stress of, you know, if they've got their own businesses or if they're employed, that 
people's employment was on the line yeah. the whole time and it still is. It and still is. Yeah, and people have suffered hugely financially and continue to. Yeah. So I think that it sounds like they were holding stress in that sense of, you know, the expectation socially is for them to be the provider. And there's an intense amount of pressure that comes along with that. Mm. And, and of course, we're talking very generically here about mm. gender roles. Absolutely. And, you know, different households look different. But yeah, in general, it, it does seem like there were some gender differences in how we held stress in the pandemic. Again, that comes down to this concept of how the body and the mind feels safe, right? So if we don't have our needs being met, it's more about going, how am I going to make myself feel safe? Have I got a roof over my head? Have I got food on the table so that I can make sure that I'm providing? And it it is different how we're wired in that sense. And I'm still seeing that impact of safety around people's workplaces coming through. Particularly, I work a lot with the tourism businesses and they're still going, even though technically people are coming in the door, we've got customers, I still don't know if the business is going to be in the next year. So even though they are showing up to work, there's still this feeling of like, I'm holding my breath and then I'm not sure if I'm safe in what I'm doing and in my role and in this business. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we had an experience that we could never have really predicted. And so, of course, that then makes us feel uncertain about our stability moving forward. It's the idea that anything now could happen and that this whole other world of possibilities has been opened up to us. And and that is a really scary thing. And it's going to be impacting how people make decisions about employment as well, Mm. whether it's, you know, do I take the risk, go out Mm. on my own, Mm. set my own thing up, or do I stay where I am? Because I know that, you know, I've been here for a while, Mm. even though I'm not that happy, can I take the risk to try and find different employment? Mm. Because nothing feels guaranteed anymore. Yeah. Well, I love what you're saying there around that risk. It's risk balance Mm. between is this job safer? Has it got the best environment? Or is it going to be this other one on the other side where the grass may be greener, but actually there's still going to be other aspects that are going to challenge me. What I'm also seeing Mm. is that when we're staying stuck in that state of dysregulation, because the body's being pushed into that hypervigilant stage at work, whether it's with that, like we said, the expectations, the workload, the boundaries, the conflicts, then our body's energy tank, this nervous system starts to creep into a little bit of overload. And that is where it's hard to know when it goes from just being a little bit of, you know, acute stress to then suddenly chronic stress. And I think that's because we're not good at learning how to push the reset button. We've got to do this as a whole culture. We can't expect that people have these tools. This is probably what I want people to think about is it's got to go from a body reaction first in many ways is what I would have said to help bring safety and then you can come back off into the mind but if your sleep is not in a a place which is restorative where you can recharge and feel refreshed then that is going to influence everything in your life that's going to influence your brain function it's going to influence your communication it's definitely going to influence the way that you deal with your relationships at work because your emotional bandwidth is going to be shortened and so if there was only probably one thing that I could people to change when they're feeling in that chronic stress is to take some time to start to reset their sleep pattern to give them some control over maybe what's happening during their week. Yeah, sleep is such a tough one. It's so temperamental and I really think it is, and I guess you've seen the same thing, I think it is often the first thing to go. It's often one of the first questions that I ask people is how are you sleeping and how are you eating? Because, Mm. yeah, when we're under the chronic stress, those two things aren't the priority anymore when the lion is running towards you. Mm eating and sleeping are kind of far off your list. The eating piece is a big part that you deal with clients, right? Because the mind interaction with that gut brain and the eating disorders and all that control piece is really powerful. Yeah. So I work in private practice and one of my groups of clients that I see are people who struggle with um, disordered eating, which has been really interesting to observe, particularly post-pandemic. We saw a big spike in eating disorders as a result of the pandemic. And we know that a lot of the time eating disorders are 
a way of people trying to gain control in some sense. So there's clear links between high stress and disordered eating. It doesn't have to be, you know, full diagnostic disordered eating, but at times it is. But also using food as a means of self-soothing during times of stress and distress, um, whether that be through restriction. Restriction has the ability to numb emotional responses and the other side of it being sort of overeating Mm. um, as a means to try and soothe yourself. Mm. So people often struggle with one of those two things. I know that a lot of people in particular struggle with overeating during times of high stress. Mm. And part of that is a self-soothing thing. You know, we like to eat and we like to eat yum things and that's that's one of the things that we can do to make ourselves feel better which is okay <laughs> as long as it's our not it's not our primary way of soothing ourselves so hey your friend has a bad day and you bring her some chocolate it's okay it's just it can't be her primary coping mechanism the other side of it is when we're so stressed and we're in chronic fight or flight it's a hormonal thing inside us it's a release of cortisol and cortisol makes us hungry and it makes us crave like fats and sugars so that's why you might find yourself reaching for more like energy dense foods during times of stress and that's a daily stress roller coaster so I like you brought that up because a lot of stuff that I deal with is this awareness around okay if you're feeling this like 10 o'clock 10 a.m craving for a hit whether it be a coffee or a chocolate or a muffin or something to kind of I guess, decrease that feeling of stress. Often that's because you've been burning through that adrenaline and you're using your quick energy stores. So you're using your glycogen, which is in your muscles and in your liver. And the body's like, can you just hook me up? I just need something to replace that. And so if you're riding that roller coaster through the day, and again, you're driving it with caffeine, then you're still not listening into the body and you're pushing it into that flight, fight, freeze mode Mm -hmm. and that hypervigilance mode. And so when you begin to listen in and go, actually, is my body asking for me to drink more water? Is it asking me to pause? Then we learn that self-regulation comes in those small moments and that we've got to keep doing that so that by the end of the day, we're not in a state of going, I feel terrible. I feel exhausted. Open that bottle of wine. I need to drown myself to that point where Mm -hmm. I feel relaxed and calm and again, numb out in a different way. What Mm -hmm. I'm hearing is that when we go through in those stressful moments, we are finding ways to cope that have been part of society and our normal day-to-day living. This is the way we cope with it. We're just not dealing with the why we deal with stress. The first step to trying to manage all of this is to look inside and to try and develop self-awareness about your own experience with Mm. stress, how your body responds. So what are your warning signs? Do you notice fatigue? Do you notice social withdrawal? Do you notice you're waking up with a racing heart? And if so, then what are some of the things that you've tried in the past or you would like to try that might help you to manage it? So you become kind of the observer of your own experience Mm -hmm. rather than what we tend to do. You know, I like the use of the word hijack is, is feel like we've just been hijacked all day. We're just running from coffee to meeting to another coffee. And then you get to the end of the day And you are exhausted and your fight or flight has been going all day, moving from stressor to stressor. And yeah, and it's really common that you would reach for the bottle of wine or, I don't know, vape or whatever Mm. it is as a means of self-soothing. But of course, if we're relying on those things too much, we're not actually learning how to self-regulate and learn how to self-soothe on an internal level. If we learn what off looks like, then that is where we circuit break it. And that's going to be different for everybody. You've just got to navigate what works for you. If you took this time over even this next year to rewrite the way that you deal with stress at work, that will shift and change your relationships. It will shift and change your productivity and definitely your engagement and your enjoyment in work. But it's hard work and it depends Mm. on the culture you're in. But today we're really focusing on how do we listen in and maybe what is coming up for you if you're listening to the podcast is that I have been feeling this or I have been feeling that and that is normal. 
Those are all normal reactions to stress. The volume may be higher because of the pandemic. That is normal. And that Mm. what's really powerful is that the more that you create the awareness around it, the more that you build connections with others and have discussions around work stress, that's what well-being is. When you shift out of that mode and become aware of what it looks like to create a circuit break in that stress reaction, it seems challenging, it seems hard work, but actually it's still really simple. I have loved having a conversation today, Dr. Vic. What's come up for you today that you want people to be aware of? I suppose we're asking people to take a little step back and just observe what's going on for them and see if they can adjust and realign the way that they're engaging with work in a way that feels better for them. Yeah, that would be my take home. I love that. Shift the way that we deal with stress, make it your superpower, and then notice how that changes the relationships and the connections around you. Mm. We hope today's episode has shown that you can get control of the way that you deal with stress. And the more that you do this, you have a snowball effect that'll create a long-term change and impact the way that your mind and your body reacts. We also know that some of the episodes will be triggering and that depending on what's happening in your world, you may need to talk to somebody about that. You can reach out for help in so many different ways. That first action of reaching out may be the most difficult thing you do, but also the catalyst for getting the support that you need. You can talk to your local doctor, you can talk to friends and family that you trust, and if you need to, you can also reach out to local hotlines to help you deal with what you're experiencing. In New Zealand, that number is 1737. We'll also put some resources into the show notes in case you want to explore this further. You can also take a few of the breathing quizzes on my website, www.thebreatheffect.com, and I'll put the link in the show notes so that you can take the breathing quiz, find out a bit more about how your body's reacting to stress, and check out any of my free resources there as well that you might be interested in. You can also reach out if you'd like to work with me, whether it's one-on-one coaching, whether it's in your business, whether it's coming and joining us in Bali or in New Zealand on our retreats. And maybe it's just a note to say, hey, this is what I'd like to learn more about. Or could you ask Dr. Victoria this? Whatever it is, please reach out. We love to hear from you. In this podcast, we will continue to celebrate the courage to explore, learn and grow. Never underestimate the power you have to shift the world, foster hope and create connection. There's the simple things that you do every day that add up, including the way that you breathe, the way that you move and the way that you think. So take a moment and shift one of those things today. Today.